Hello, hi everyone. Uh, the topic for today's lecture is occlusion in complete tensors. Uh, moving on, learning objectives. Now, uh, what do you mean by occlusion and what is the importance of occlusion in complete tensors? This you, we will study based on the following outcomes. That is, first is you should be able to differentiate between the natural and the artificial occlusion, that is, occlusion in complete tensors. The next thing you should be able to list the five objectives of balanced occlusion. What is balanced occlusion? What are the factors that affect it? And the various objectives. Third, you should be able to describe and relate the importance of various compensatory curves in a balanced occlusion, namely curve of Spee, curve of Wilson, curve of Molson, reverse curve, pressure curve, etc. Also, finally, you should also have some idea about what a lingualized occlusion scheme is. Okay, so moving on. Coming to the introduction, now what is occlusion? Occlusion is a static relationship between the incising or masticating surfaces of maxillary mandibular teeth or the tooth analogs, that is artificial teeth. So occlusion is basically the relationship between the occlusal surfaces or occluding surfaces of the teeth. Prior to the selection element of the artificial teeth, the type of occlusal scheme is planned, that is whether we are going to go for a balanced occlusion or a lingualized occlusion or a monoplane occlusion or whether we are not going to use balanced occlusion at all. It is important to understand the differences in the occlusion between natural teeth and the complete denture teeth. After all, they are quite different from each other. Now let us take a look at the differences between the natural and artificial occlusion. As we all know, natural teeth are retained in the parental ligament, which is anchored in the bone of the maxilla and the mandible. So these are the natural teeth. This, the green area is the PDL, parental ligament, which encompasses the root of the teeth and which are anchored to the alveolar sockets. Now, as you can see here, the teeth are independent of each other and they move independently to the masticating and the occluding forces. The non, the malloc, if there is any malocclusion, it affects independently that teeth only and does not affect the other teeth per se. Non-vertical forces such as lateral forces in the mesodistal or buccalingual uh, direction they are usually tolerated well and they are tolerated by the teeth in question. They do not affect the, all the other teeth in the arch. Bilateral balance occlusions are rare in the natural dentition which is, since it is not, not a natural thing and it is a man-made or the uh, type of occlusion which is specifically created to be designed in complete dentures for the sake of stability and retention of the complete dentures. So natural dentition does not have balanced occlusion it is uh, governed by different factors such as we can see canine guide occlusion, we see group function occlusion, we see maximum inter intercuspation. Also, because of the PDL ligament which contains various receptors, namely like mechanoreceptors, proprioceptors, the teeth are ex have excellent tactile sens sensibility. Whereas, when you look at denture teeth, that is artificial teeth, denture teeth are anchored to mobile bases on the mucosa. So, this is a denture. Where this is the basal seat of the denture and the teeth are added to the basal seat or fixed to the basal seat. They do not move independently. They are not anchored into the alveolar socket like the natural teeth. So therefore the teeth move as a unit and malocclusion will affect the stability of the entire denture. Non-vertical forces will affect all the teeth and may result in trauma to the underlying soft tissue. Incising affects all the teeth that are attached to the base. Bilateral balance occlusion is often hence required for the stability of complete dentures. There is no or decreased tactile sensi sensibility as tactile sensibility or sensitivity is only confined to the sensory feedback from the mucosa. Now, looking at some relevant terms so once again we come back to centric relationship countless times we have described the definition of centric relationship i'm, I'm sure uh, most of you must be knowing this by the, uh, by now centric relation is a maxillary mandibular relationship independent of the contact of the tooth in which the condyles articulate in the anterior superior position against the posterior slopes of the articular eminence. So this is the articular eminence, this is the anterior slope, this is the posterior slope and the condyles are in the anterior superior position. 
In this position, the mandible is restricted to a purely rotatory movement. Does not that is the mandible does not display any sliding movement or any Bennett side shift. It purely rotates like a hinge around a terminal hinge axis. That is a true axis of the mandibular or the condylar rotation. The patient can make vertical lateral protrusive movements from this position, and it is a useful and clinically repeatable position. That is centric relationship. As I mentioned, it is independent of tooth contact. It is purely rotatory, and it is anatomically determined by the articular eminence, the glenoid fossa, the articular disc, and the head of the condyle, as well as the elasticity of the ligaments of the temporomandibular joint. So, next, coming to the requirements of a complete denture occlusion, the cutting and shearing efficiency of the incisal occlusal surfaces with sluice face for escape of the food. There should be minimal area of contact to reduce the forces on the residual alveolar ridges during mastication. There should be a favorable tooth to ridge crest position for the functional liver balance. That is, tooth should be arranged on the center of the ridge, following uh, a, along a line drawn along the center of the ridge. There should be reduced posterior cuspal height to control the horizontal forces. That is, the cuspal inclines should be shallow. There should be reduced buccal angle width of the posterior teeth so as to decrease the forces transmitted to the underlying residual ridges. Also, they should have a surface to direct. Uh, they should have a surface to direct the forces in in a vertical direction. Occlusal forces should be directed towards the anterior posterior center of the ridge. Also, the occlusal plane should be parallel to the main foundation plane. All, they should allow the setting of the denture bases without interference or locking of the cusp. No anterior teeth contact should be there except during protrusion or retrusion. That is, during maximum intercuspation or during centric occlusion, the anterior teeth should have sufficient overjet to prevent the contact between the anterior teeth. The stability of the occlusion in centric there should be stability of occlusion in centric and eccentric relationship. This can be achieved only if we are planning balanced occlusion in complete denture. Other terms like mass, maximum intercuspation. Maximum intercuspation. The complete intercuspation of the opposing teeth independent of the condylar position, sometimes referred to as the best fit of the teeth regardless of the condylar position. This is usually seen in the natural dentition. In the complete denture, we make sure that the centric relation and the centric occlusion coincide. So what is centric occlusion? It is the occlusion of the opposing teeth when the mandible is in the centric relationship. Now, other terms like Christensen's phenomenon. What is Christensen's phenomena? It is the creation of space between the posterior teeth bilaterally during protrusion or during lateral protrusive excursions. That is, the anterior teeth will prevent the contact of the posterior teeth during protrusion and, do, and the canine will pro, uh, prevent the contact of the posterior teeth during the lateral excursion. This is called as this is so that the, the anterior teeth protect the posterior teeth during excursive movements and during centric relationship or maximum intercuspation, the posterior teeth protect the anterior teeth from coming into contact. As I mentioned again, this is only confined in the natural dentition. Now coming to balanced occlusion. Balanced occlusion per se by definition is defined as a bilateral that is both right and left simultaneous anterior and posterior contact of the occlusal surface of the teeth in centric and eccentric positions. It is developed to lessen or limit the tipping or the rotating of the denture bases in relation to the supporting structures. Balanced occlusion is uniquely in complete dentures and as I mentioned is not a part of the natural teeth. So, what are the objectives of balanced occlusion? First, the primary objective is to improve the stability of the denture during function that is mastication, chewing, gnawing, etc. It should improve the stability and retention of the denture during parafunctional movements. It should reduce the resorption of the residual ridges as we are aiming to limit the forces on the residual ridges. Thereby, we intend to reduce the resorption of the residual alveolar ridges and to reduce the trauma from the occlusal forces on the oral tissues and the, that is mucosa and the residual ridges and also to improve the comfort for the patient by, by ensuring that we allow all the above objectives. Now coming to the factors that affect the balanced occlusion, there are five factors namely the condylar guidance, the incisor guidance, 
the occlusal plane, the compensatory curves, and the cuspal inclination. These five factors were originally described by Hanau as a Hanau squint. Now coming to condylar guidance. So mandibular guidance, condylar guidance is a mandibular guidance generated by the condyle and the articular disc traversing the contour of the glenoid fossa. So this is the glenoid fossa and the movement of the condyle against the incline of the glenoid fossa is termed as the condylar guidance. Concert diagonals is due to the path followed by the condyle in the temporal mind mandibular joint capsule. So, this is the mandibular guidance. Also, condyle guidance is known as horizontal guidance. This guidance is generated by the condyles traversing the contours of the glenoid fossa. It is then duplicated in the articulator. The extent of the duplication depends upon the ability of the articulator, whether it is a non-adjustable articulator, a semi-adjustable articulator or a fully adjustable articulator like class 4 A and B articulators. Now the protrusive condylar guidance is obtained when we obtain protrusive records from the patient and lateral condylar guidance are obtained by using Hanau's formula which was described in the previous lecture or by using lateral records in articulators that accept the lateral records. So, when the condylar guidance is ideal, that is, we aim to keep the condylar guidance minimal so that during protrusion, the posterior exclusion between the occluding surfaces of the upper and lower dentures remains minimal. If the condylar guidance is steep, it will create a excessive separation of the occluding surface of the posterior teeth during protrusion and retrusion, which we do not want in complete dentures. Next up is the incisal guidance. Incisal guidance is the angle formed between the horizontal plane of the occlusion that is this is the horizontal plane and the line drawn in the sagittal plane between the incisal edges of the maxillary and the mandibular teeth in maximum intercuspation. So this is the incisal guidance that is between the occlusal plane and between the occluding surfaces of the maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth. So this is our incisal guidance. Now, if this angle is steep, it will require steep cuspal incline, steep occlusal plane and steep compensative curves to obtain the occlusal balance. So, usually in class 2 type of dentition or when we are unable to arrange the teeth in any other occlusal scheme other than class 2, the incisal guidance is very steep. In that case, we have to increase the horizontal condylar guidance. We have to increase the cuspal inclines by selecting anatomic teeth which have a 33 degree angulation of the cuspal inclines instead of semi-anatomic or non-anatomic teeth. We will also have to make the occlusal plane more steep instead of parallel to the residual ridges. We will need to use uh, steep compensative curves like the curve of Spee, curve of Wilson, curve of Monsoon, Pleasures curve, etc. All in an effort to create a balanced occlusion with when the incisal guidance is steep. Whereas when the incisal guidance is shallow, like in this case where the overjet is, uh, we have a sufficient overjet of the maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth. In that case, uh, we can have a shallow condylar guidance, we can use uh, uh, a steep, uh, less steeper oc occlusal plane, we can use semi-anatomic teeth which have a 20 degree cuspal incline instead of the anatomic teeth. So now coming to the third factor that affects the balance occlusion is the orientation of the occlusal plane. Now as we know, occlusal plane is the uh, parallel contact between the upper and lower occluding rims in complete tension. Usually occlusal plane is uh, is defined or determined by the parallelism with the alatrigal line in the lateral view and in the frontal view parallelism with the interpupillary line and in the mandibular complete denture the occlusal plane should be parallel or extend up to the two-thirds of the retromolar pad. Usually the aim is to provide occlusal plane which is midway between the up up occluding ridges that is uh, between the edentulous maxillary and mandibular ridges it is oriented in the same relationship as when the natural teeth existed. Hence, there is not much scope to maneuver the occlusal plane. But yes, as I mentioned, if the incisal or condylar guidance is very steep, the occlusal plane instead of horizontal can, made, can be made slightly steeper. So next, compensating, uh, coming to the compensative curves. Compensating curves are the anterior, posterior and lateral curvatures in the alignment of the occluding surfaces and incisal edges of the artificial teeth that are used to develop palace occlusion. 
So what are these compensating curves? They are basically two categories of compensating curve, anterior posterior curves and posterior medial lateral curve. Anterior posterior compensating curves like the curve of SPE, they run in the AP direction that is anterior posterior direction and help in obtaining a protrusive balance. Whereas the medial lateral compensating curves, they run in a lateral direction and they are helpful in obtaining the balance in the lateral protrusive movements. So let us come to the curve of SPE which is an anterior compensating curve. So, curve of SPE is located in an AP direction that is anteroposterior direction and it is a curve that begins with the cuspid of the mandibular canine and following the buccal cusp of the premolars and the molar teeth continuing through the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible ending with the anteriormost portion of the mandibular cordine. So, basically curve of SPE is a curve that follows the tip or the incisal edges of the occluding surface of the mandibular teeth so basically it is like the monsoon curve where the, the teeth are occluding against the surface of a sphere which is 8 inches in diameter and the center at the glabula. This was first described by Graf Spee in 1890. So this compensating curve will help us in the balance of the denture in the protrusive movements of the mandible. Next up is the curve of Wilson. This is a mediolateral curve. This curve is convex downwards that is towards the mandible. The curve appears like a convex profile. This was given by Wilson in 1911 and this is again useful in the arrangement of teeth in the balanced occlusion. It is used for the arrangement of the molars. The lingual molars or the lower molars are tipped lingually whereas the upper molars are tipped buccally in order to get balance during lateral protrusive movements. Next is the anti-monsoon curve or the reverse curve. This is a curve which is concave in a medial lateral direction that is curve of Wilson was convex in a medial lateral direction and this reverse curve or anti-monsoon curve is concave upwards that is this is usually used to arrange the first premolar that is uh, as you know in a glass plate relationship, the maxillary first premolar, only the buccal cusp should uh, touch the glass plate. This is because of the reverse curve of the anti-monsoon curve. Next coming to the curve of monsoon. Curve of monsoon is also a mediolateral curve. This is a curve of occlusion in which each cusp and incisal edge conform to a segment of a sphere 8 inches in diameter with its center at the glabella. This was described by George Monsoon. This curve is a three dimensional and is a combination of the curve of Spee and curve of Wilson. So all these curves are conformed to a sphere which is 8 inches in diameter with the center at the glass. So here we can see this is the mandible and the occluding surface of the mandibular teeth conformed to a sphere which is 8 inches in diameter and with its uh, center at the glabella. So this is a mediolateral curve that is the curve of monsoon and if you see it in anterior posterior plane it is called as a curve of Wilson. Next up is the pleasures curve. This curve is usually associated with reversal of the occlusal plane in the premolar, first molar and the second molar teeth whereby the occlusal surface of the mandibular teeth slope facially. So here we can see occlusal surface of the mandibular teeth are sloping facially. This we usually see or this type of pressure curve is given when we use monoplane teeth or zero degree teeth uh, there is there, there are no cuspal inclines and in old dentures patients who have been wearing dentures for 10 years 15 years there is attrition or wear out of the occlusal surfaces and we get to see what is termed as the pleasures curve so in this type of curvature uh, we the premolars are the maxillary premolars are tipped buccally that is the first premolars and the second premolars the mandibular first molar is kept has a flat occlusal plane that is it is neither tipped buccally or lingually whereas the mandibular second molar has a sloping occlusal surface which is sloping facially so this these three are a combination of the pleasure curve so this is the combination this pleasure curve is a combination of the curve of Wilson, the reverse or curve or the anti-monsoon curve and the first molar is set at a flat occlusal plane. 
so curve of uh, pleasures curve is the combination of curve of monsoon and the anti monsoon curve it is used for arranging as i mentioned non anatomic or zero degree teeth in a balanced occlusion now coming to the last factor that is the cuspal inclination cuspal inclination is the angle uh, the angle made by the average slope of the cusp with the cuspal plane measured mesiodistally and buccolingually and it is also called as a cuspal angle this has effect on the occlusal plane and the compensating curve they are or interrelated that is the slope uh, of the occlusal plane the compensating curve and the cuspal inclines they are all interrelated to each other the closer a tooth is located to the condylar guidance the more influence the guidance has on the cuspal inclination in anatomic teeth it is preferable to eliminate the mesodistal cuspal inclines as they only have buck and as then only buccolingual inclines are needed to be considered for balanced arrangement of the so this is a hanau squint which i mentioned earlier and all the five factors such as the condylar guidance the incisal guidance the plane of occlusion the cuspal inclination and the compensating curve are uh determining factors in the balanced occlusion now coming to the monoplane occlusion after balanced occlusion next up is a monoplane occlusion this is an occlusal arrangement wherein the posterior teeth have masticatory surfaces that last lack any cuspal height that is the posterior teeth do not have any cuspal inclines or the cuspal height such as you see in the anatomic teeth or semi anatomic teeth basically we have a flat occlusal scheme with only uh, sluice ways for the uh, chewing and mastication this is an occlusal arrangement in which we use non anatomic teeth or monoplane teeth or zero degree teeth this is based on the philosophy that by eliminating the cuspal incline the lateral forces on the denture will be reduced thereby enhancing the stability of the denture especially in poor or extremely resorbed residual alveolar ridges where you don't have any uh, vertical uh, walls of the ridge to prevent the lateral movement of the dentures to begin with so this is not an ideal occlusal scheme but uh, when we in certain situations we prefer to use monoplane occlusion so the anti teeth are arranged with an overjet of 2 mm and no overbite so there should be an overjet of 2 mm between the anterior teeth and there is no overbite as the overbite will prevent will cause the disclusion of the posterior teeth and will increase the instability of the denture so how do you bring about uh, uh, balanced occlusion in a monoplane occlusal scheme this can usually be achieved by creating a ramp or slope just distal to the mandibular second molar so when the patient does excurs a uh, protrusive a uh, mandibular movements in that case when the disclusion of the posterior teeth occur this balancing ram will uh, keep contact with the upper denture base or the upper second molar and uh, give a three point contact that is two balancing rams on the posterior anterior contact with the anterior teeth during protrusive movement this will create a sort of balance occlusion or the balanced relationship of the upper and lower dentures in relation to the monoplane teeth the another way of improving balanced occlusion in a monoplane occlusal scheme is to reduce the number of the teeth that is by eliminating the second molar or by reducing the anterior posterior uh, occluding table occlusal table we can improve the balance or the balance thing arrangement in a monoplane occlusion So, what are the advantages of monoplane occlusal scheme? First of all, it is very easy to arrange the teeth in a monoplane occlusal scheme. We can we do not require a semi-adjustable articulator or fully adjustable articulator. We can use a simple hinge articulator such as a class one or class two articulator. Entire it is easier for the occlusal team to achieve, especially in the following conditions such as if the patient has poor neuromuscular control. patient has malocclusion like a class 3 or class 2 ridge relationship when there is excessive residual ridge resorption in these cases is it easier to achieve a centric relationship in a monoplane occlusal scheme what are the disadvantages of these uh, this monoplane occlusal scheme first of all it is of course it is less aesthetic as because there are no cuspal inclines the flat, a flat occlusal scheme there is less chewing efficiency because there is no cuspal height there is no sharp cusp to actually share the food or help in the grinding so patient has to put a lot of effort in grinding or mashing the food which is already difficult because of the poor residual ridges 
unstable denture in patient with a steep condyle ligand in patient that may have a steep condyle guidance or the uh, occlusion of the teeth is very close to the condyle guidance or the tmg of the patient in such cases like class 2 relationship it is difficult to uh, have a stable denture in such situations it's coming to the lingualized occlusion lingualized occlusion can be defined as a form of denture occlusion where the maxillary lingual cusps articulate with the mandibular central occlusal surface that is they articulate with the central fossa of the occlusal surfaces in a centric working and non-working mandibular position so these are the maxillary teeth with a prominent palatal cusp and the mandibular teeth that generally have shallow cuspal inclines and in centric relation on or centric occlusion only the palatal cusp of the maxillary teeth articulates with the central fossa of the mandibular posterior teeth this uh, in a way creates a balancing occlusion in lateral torsive contacts we can see when the patient does uh, left and right uh, lateral torsive movements of the mandible always the palatal cusp of the maxillary denture teeth are in contact with the occlusal surface of the mandibular posterior teeth thereby creating a sort of balanced occlusion indications of lingualized occlusion is when there is high aesthetic demand when there is severe mandibular ridge resorption, when there are displaceable supporting tissues like thick mucosal biotype, flabby ridges or uh, uh, traumatic ridges, when there is malocclusion, that is we find a class 3 or class 2 relationship, most of the uh, indications are similar to monoplane occlusion, a patient with previous successful denture with a lingualized occlusion. In Even today we see many of the European countries uh, a lingualized occlusion is followed by many uh, doctors and uh, denture technicians for the arrangement of the artificial denture teeth occlusal scheme. Advantages are good aesthetic because it is better than the monoclonal occlusion. There is freedom of, of the non-anatomic teeth. Uh, there is a potential for bilateral balance as I mentioned. Always the palatal cusp of the maxillary posterior is in contact with the occlusal surface of the mandibular posteriors. The, Contact of the max, uh, palatal cusp of the maxillary teeth ensures that the forces are uh, transferred in a vertical direction to the mandibular israelular ridges. There is minimum tipping forces because of the centralization of the vertical forces. And because the palatal, we are using uh, anatomic teeth in the maxillary ridge, it is easier for the chewing and for the sharing of the forces, basically a mortar and pestle effect. So next coming to the summary, the closure scheme selected should satisfy the aesthetic and functional needs of the patient. Anatomic teeth show slightly better uh, chewing efficiency than the non-anatomic teeth because they have cuspal inclines and the sharp cusp. The concept of bilateral balance occlusion and its necessity has been debated for many years. Due to the real effect or resiliency like effect of the mucosa which was first described by Hanau who stated that the rhythmic the mucosa overlying the residual ridges is mainly 80% of water. So when the upper and lower denture come in contact during the mastication, the occlusal forces cause the compression of the res uh, mucosa of the residual lower ridges, thereby causing settling of the denture. So this is termed as a resiliency like effect. So he questioned the actual uh, necessity for the balanced occlusion to be incorporated in complete dentures so that there is contact in the eccentric as well as centric movements. That is why one of the reasons why balanced occlusion is yet to be ex, uh, accepted by general dental practitioners. Although balance, creating balanced occlusion is very difficult, it requires a lot of expertise and a lot of experience and you have to have a Facebook transfer, orientation jaw relationship and a semi-adjustable articulator in order to create balanced occlusion. The basic requirement of a uh, occlusal scheme is certainly to provide a maximum intercuspal contacts of the, all the posterior teeth in centric relationship along with no contact of the anterior teeth. There should be sufficient overjet of the anterior teeth with minimum, uh, over, uh, minimum overbite so that the teeth or the dentures remain stable during the occlusion. So that brings us to the end of this lecture.